I'm going to tell you about the future, not because this, I have get visions. Visions get you psychiatric referrals, so I never believed in visions. But it's getting pretty clear what the future will be like. And we do know about the future because in the words of the wonderful William Gibson, who is said to be a, a science fiction writer, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. So everything we're going to be talking about, we can see examples of it happening somewhere, usually in the UK, uh, but in other countries, particularly countries committed to universal health coverage. So that means probably not in the USA. So the future is here. And the other thing about the future is the future is not like Helvella or the Isle of Wight, the destination awaiting our arrival. The future is much more like the Great Western Railway or um, uh, even the M6, something we imagine, design, plan and build. So you people are now involved in the imagination and planning of the future. And it uh, will be you who will be running the health service in 2029 and 2039. Not me. Um, with a bit of luck, I'll be a patient in 2029 but probably not in 2039. So this is about the future. Health, what is health? And here's the famous WHO definition. And it's useful to remember this, but also to be cautious that we in the NHS cannot provide a com state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. So the, the focus is very much on the absence of disease or infirmity. But we can also, by the way we deliver care, we can adversely affect people's well-being. And one of the trends we're seeing now internationally is a move away from the excitement of technology and focusing simply on outcomes as defined by uh, clinicians to outcomes that matter to individuals. And we'll, we'll discuss this. So, firstly, what is population health management? Now, uh, I'm going to show you the next PowerPoint is um, a bit daunting because what happens when new terms are invented is that different academics develop different definitions. Uh, the, the term has different meanings. And here's uh, examples of some of the, the meanings that are bouncing about at the moment. Have a look there, there's the NHS England. Um, flat pack, population health, um, by data-driven planning and delivery of proactive care. But remember, population health is also influenced by deprivation and the physical environment. So NHS England, us, we cannot deliver all of that. Uh, Philips Healthcare, you see, is, is into this now. The aggregation of patient data across multiple technologies. Greg Fell on the bottom right, uh, a, a systematic whole po population focus to improve the management of risks in a population, uh, not in a service oriented way. So as you can see, there's a number of different databases. And the one that we are using in the West Midlands Academy is in the next year. So, Here's, here's my definition, I'm not asking people to adopt it, but here's a definition. So population health management is an approach that focuses on population subgroups or segments. There are different languages being used defined by a common need. And I've given some examples here, um, working age adults with complex problems, uh, older people with frailty, uh, people at the end of life. And then it could be long-term conditions. I've never met anyone who's told me they've got a long-term condition, but people with asthma, people with depression, people with heart failure. So that is the obsessional focus. And it doesn't focus on professions or institutions or interventions. So it's not now no longer focusing on primary care or secondary care or hospitals and mental health trusts. And it's not about pathology services or imaging services, or uh, it's about population groups defined by need. So this is the definition. There's a, 
a slight distinction in many people's mind about population health and how bold we should be. And I, I think it's very good to be seeking to improve the health of your population. But we don't have much of an impact directly on poverty to take one huge important variable and determinant of health. So all we can do is try to mitigate the effects of poverty. So population health management approach that focuses on population subgroups and its aim, its aim is to increase value for individuals and populations. And we'll come on to consider what we do there. So I think the first um, uh, little piece to think about is the definition of population health management. And I'm going to give you um, just a minute to make a note or scribble something about this. Uh, population health management is the approach that focuses on population subgroups defined by common need. For example, children or teenagers or um, people in the last year of life or people with back pain. And its aim is to optimize value for the individuals and for the population. Just uh, reflect on that as uh, um, a definition. And uh, if there's questions or points you'd like to raise in the chat room, could you please do that? And let's just take a minute to think. If you're with someone else, have a chat to them about, about this definition. There will be <coughs> a decision made by, uh, about population health management. But let me say a little bit about, uh, uh, this is our definition, which has not been formally adopted yet. Uh, my own view is that there should be a clear definition. And the military are very good at doing this. The military, they call it doctrine. And the military would undoubtedly spend a lot of time defining what is meant by population health management and how you'd measure it. So too with industry, and my, my own personal mission has been to focus much more on language than on data, that uh, people like yourselves should be people who are using language in, uh, with the same meaning. So the, the military, of course, have more time to spend in, in training and rehearsal than we do. They would probably spend three months with a group of people, young and old, uh, writing down definitions. They do that with terms like manoeuvre, for example. So population health management, uh, there's one definition of it. Uh, we're using the West Midlands, uh, but uh, it's not been formally adopted yet by the, uh, the ICSs or other trusts. In the military or in business, a team made up of people from the ICSs would reach agreement on the meaning of the term, not the definition, but the meaning of the term. And we'll come back to the meaning a little bit later. Okay, so how are we going to get more value from the resources uh, that we have available? And let's just review what's happened in the last 20 years. What have we done? Well, we've done very, very well. Um, so it's 1948 actually, there's been an increase in life expectancy of about 10 years. There's much more interest, in, interest now in healthy life expectancy than simple life expectancy, but there's also been an increase in healthy life expectancy as well as life expectancy. And that's been very, very powerful and determined in no small part to the NHS. So it's been terrific. And we've done four things that have been very effective. Prevention, we've done pretty well at prevention. Look at what's happened to heart disease, for example. Secondly, we've used evidence-based decision-making to ensure that only interventions with evidence of cost-effectiveness are offered. Thirdly, there's been a significant improvement in quality and safety. And fourthly, there's been a focus on productivity on reducing cost. So those four things have been of terrific importance uh, and they must continue. 
But while we've been doing these four things, we've also been doing some other things called reorganizations. And there is little evidence that they have made a significant contribution because structure is the least important part of a health service. We'll come on to talk about the other two parts, systems and culture. So the frequent reorganization of the health service has often distracted. And of course, we're a bit in the middle of that at the moment. Um, NHS E and I was very quickly said at the beginning, but that is, I know from speaking to those of you involved, that is, has been and is a big reorganization. Now, I'm not saying that structure is completely unimportant, uh, but Gandhi said, and it's important to remember Gandhi's line, that there is no structure that can make bad people behave well, but the wrong structure can make good people behave badly. So some things we've done, particularly splitting purchaser from provider in 1990, have made us behave in different ways that have not added value to individuals and populations. So we've done very well. We've wasted a bit of time on reorganization. But at the end of all this progress, there are three big problems that we can see in every country in the world. One of them is unwarranted variation, that is variation in services delivered to population that cannot be explained by variation in need or by the explicit choice of the people involved. And those were published in our atlases of variation. The variation is important because it reveals the two other problems. One of them is the overuse of lower value technology. And the second is the underuse of lower, of higher value technology. And this is often complicated by inequity as we'll discuss a little bit later. So to summarize, we've done four things that are very important and must continue. Prevention, evidence-based decision-making, quality improvement, and cost reduction. But these are necessary and not sufficient because while we've been doing these things, three other problems have persisted or emerged, namely unwanted variation, underuse, overuse, linked to inequity. They, we've done good work we wasted time on reorganization. So what are we going to do if we're not going to reorganize? And if what we've done has simply, has simply um, uh, made a difference in quality and safety, but we're still faced with this growing gap between need uh, on the one hand and resources on the other. And the answer we can use um, the approach that we've used in the past alone. We have to take a new approach. So population health management. And there are five key tasks for population health management. And they're set out on this slide here. Um, again, just pause. If you're, if you're with someone, just reflect on what I've been saying. We've done very well. We've done four things that are very important must continue. We've reorganized. It's been at best a waste of resource and sometimes made people's work much more difficult. At the end of the era of progress, we've got unwanted variation, overuse and underuse. So more of the same is not the answer. And the new paradigm is population health management. While you're, while you're thinking about that, let me just focus on this issue of what we've achieved. Um, and a lot of it has been amazing high-tech healthcare. And the high-tech healthcare has been things like chemotherapy, hip replacement, cataract operation, imaging, lab testing, uh, multiphysic lab testing. So that's been what we've done and it's required very good management and leadership and significant increase in resources to do it. In health and social care services for a long time, how far do you think we've come with this? Well, th this, uh, We'll come back to integration. Um, the answer is 
not very far. And of course, the 1990 reorganization disintegrated the NHS consciously. And I've worked for both local authorities and the health and the NHS. I remember, interestingly, when I started work in a local authority in 1971, I was working mostly with older people. And everyone told me the problem was rates versus taxes, district nurses and home helps. So I went to Northern Ireland for the first time and I thought, wonderful, you know, there's a single budget in Northern Ireland, so they'll have an integrated service. But what I found was pretty much the same as in, as in England, namely the doctors didn't like the nurses, the nurses didn't like the social workers and the social workers didn't like the doctors. So it was the, the, the professional tribes rather than the bureaucracy that was the problem. And sometimes, I mean, one of the issues about reorganization, John, is that we believe we're going to solve this by having joint committees or a single budget. But um, as you can see by looking at these, these five here, number five, which is there just for chronology, not because it's the fifth in importance, is a culture of collective responsibility. Do we all feel it that we're in it together? And actually the reorganization of structure have not helped with this. I feel we are now recognizing the limitations of structural reorganization and we are seeing some people ignoring the structure and getting on with doing things. And what we're asking you people now to do in ICSs uh, is to encourage networks, as you can see, number three, um, to have systems, and these systems focus on population. So let's take that as uh, uh, moving on to the five key tasks. So in addition to the fab four, there are a new famous five tasks to do. So here's the simple definition I was giving you of the aim. The aim is to optimize the use of resources, maximize outcomes that matter, and minimize inequity for the population and for individuals. Let's start with the concept of value. Now, I'm going to show you the, the most important picture in healthcare. And pictures are very important as well as words. Uh, for many people, images express things more clearly. Not just people who have got limited intelligence. It was Wittgenstein said that every idea should be expressed as a picture. So this is building up now to what I call the most important picture in healthcare. So the problem with healthcare is, as with many things in life, as you increase investment, it's the law of diminishing returns. The benefit increases and then it flattens off. Take a very simple example. Once in a lifetime cervical smear, 10 year interval, both on the steep part of the curve, five year interval, um, pretty steep. Three year interval is starting to change. One year interval is probably flat. Um, and the same holds for numbers of intensive care beds or numbers of hip replacements done. Because we tend to, as we put more resources in, we intervene with people who are less severely affected. Now, the second part of the most important picture is this, that as we put more resources in, harm goes up in direct proportion. This is not the harm from errors, but the inevitable harm of giving people radiation and chemicals and anesthetics. And what Abedis Don Abedian did in 1980 was to subtract harm from benefit and came up with this amazing curve, the point of optimality. Now, <clears throat> I'll just ask you for maybe 30 seconds to think about where we've gone beyond the point of optimality. And if you could find time just to write something down in your chat box starting now, that'd be very helpful. And I'd be doing this if I was speaking in Stafford Town Hall or Leicester County Council Hall, namely with the public as well as the profession. Okay, just write down one thing where we've gone beyond the point of optimality. Let me tell you what, what comes up consistently 
in hospitals, health centres and town halls. Um, screening, uh, a PSA screening, there, there's an issue there where you should do it at all, but all screening programmes, the more you do, uh, uh, illustrates this very well. Um, end of life care comes up in the town halls, I can tell you, oh, my mother wanted to die at home, she was admitted to hospital, she finished up in ITU, uh, they were very, they were very nice people, but it just wasn't right. The other things that come up, uh, mycoplasma, interesting, yes. Um, other issues that come up are, if you cash your back 10 minutes, you might find there's interest. Chemotherapy, um, imaging, lab testing, gone up threefold in the last 15 years. Hip replacement, cataract operations. Namely, the miracles of the last 20 years were in some populations are being overused. We've gone beyond the point of optimality. And well, certainly the, the reference to the Don Obedient work will be provided to you. It's, uh, I think this is ter terrifically important and I find people can engage with it very well. Okay, let's move. So, Triple value healthcare, and um, there's two issues, population and personal. And the population, there's really two dimensions to this, but there's an overlap between population and personal value. So population value is how well do we allocate resources for a given population. And then once the resources have been allocated to say people with atrial fibrillation or people with depression, how well are they used? And that means outcome and cost, but also related to equity, as we'll come on to discuss. And then there's personal value. So here's the, um, the statement. And the term integrated care system has been used. You should take collective responsibility for managing the resources. Not contractual with one another, but collective. And this might actually be the, the sort of watchword. We're moving from contractual to collective. Okay, back to the five. We've got, so we've got to increase value. Number one, define population subgroups. And this is uh, what's called bridges to health. And it's a combination of international classification of diseases, and a social care uh, agenda. For example, end of life is not part of the international collapse of cases diseases, but it's a very big and important issue. And NHS England and NHS Improvement are looking at this as a very simple form of categorization uh, for what are the populations. So it's people with epilepsy, or um, children, or people with dementia. So these are high level. Now, one way to think about this is to think, well, healthcare is a bit like a supermarket. In every supermarket, you can see meat, fish, vegetables. In every healthcare service in the world, you can see children, older people, people with cardiovascular disease, people with lung disease, people with mental health problems. And as you walk down the aisle in every country, you can see the same bays in the aisle, cataract, retinopathy, glaucoma, and macular degeneration. That's just like pork, lamb, beef, chicken. So it's time to think of service lines. And in a big supermarket chain, there are people responsible for the real estate, for the the supermarkets and the local markets, you know, the Sainsbury's local, Tesco local. And there are people responsible for different bits of uh, specialist services, for procurement, for logistics, um, for, re for uh, um, the management of the, the contracts with suppliers. But the highest priority is given to the service lines. Shall we switch from meat to vegetables? Shall we introduce a new service line? Children's clothing. 
for example. These are the highest level. But in the health service for the last 30 years, since the 1990 reorganization, we focus on do we want more corner shops or more supermarkets? Now, how do you know if you have been successful? So we'd be thinking about how we define a population subgroup, for example, people with respiratory disease, um, understand how it relates to Bridges for Health, if that is what is chosen as the framework, and then read the rules about saying, well, somebody's, you've got to put there, there is, so if someone comes in with diabetes and heart disease, well, we don't put it into the either diabetes budget, we put it into the budget for people with multiple problems. But this is, this is core business. These are the channel verities of healthcare. Let's just take 30 seconds. And if I ask you now to start um, picking a population subgroup in your population, and probably picking a subgroup where you felt either professionals or the right attitude, which one would you pick? Respiratory, heart disease, um, end of life care, maternity, I'll put back up Bridget there. Just um, in the chat box, write down in 30 seconds, you've got to pick one of these to have a crack at. I'm going to hold your feet to the fire and your population, which one you're going to have a crack at? <laughs> um, Building. Yeah, good, Andrew. <laughs> very complex, but very important. Yep. And uh, one, uh, one of the ICS is tag of frailty, dementia, Neil, yes. Yeah. I mean, dementia and frailty, you see, it's quite good they've got them under the same, the same number eight. I was not responsible for developing this, but because they, the same risk factors really are mental health. Yeah, mental health is a very, very big problem. You probably, you should think at this level, but maybe you're going to have to think a bit more about this if you want to tackle emotional disorders or schizophrenia. Okay, you're doing, um, you see, these are big businesses. Cardiovascular disease, that's about uh, 90 million pounds per million population. Uh, diabetes, uh, uh, they're quite good, they put those two together. These are musculoskeletal, about 70 million pounds per million population. Okay, let's move on, very good. So here's just the issues as to what you would do. How many people are there with dementia in the population that you're responsible for? What your eligibility, what do you mean by dementia? Is it, do they have to be seen by specialists or will you take a GP referral? Then what resources have been used? How do you compare with a similar population? Is there inequity? What outcomes are you achieving? And is there variation? Okay, let's move on. So, let's uh, imagine we've picked something, maybe something relatively simple like respiratory. So what would we do about it? Take respiratory or diabetes. It's a system now. This is starting to look at the population, of sub, the population subgroup with um, a particular need. And a system is a set of connected activities with a common aim. So we're all very clear, all of us are very clear what we're trying to do for people with X. So there's a common aim. We've agreed a set of outcomes that matter to people and diabetes, it would be you know, renal failure and, and blindness, but it would also be being able to lead an enjoyable life and play sport, for example. A set of objectives, and these out, out objectives are um, common to the whole population. And for each objective, we've got a measure, a criteria that we use to measure progress towards the objective of helping people play sport, for example, and a set of standards, quality standards. And it's got to be brief. So here's an example from... Um, work that we've been doing with end-of-life care. I'll just leave it up for a minute. So on the left-hand side are the outcomes that matter. 
Now, there's often different outcomes that matter to the health service than to people affected, and in this case, people and their families. So then that gets turned into um, a set of objectives. And then interestingly, at the bottom of the right-hand column are objectives for all population management programs. What we find is that the um, clinicians and patient groups we get involved, they, they focus very much on, in a way, the clinical objectives writ large for the population. But this is the new world. These four bullet points are the fruit of column two. So as an objective for all of you, and I'm now looking, imagining I'm with frontline clinicians and patient representatives, I want you all to make optimal use of resources. I want you to reduce inequity. And I want you to develop and support staff. In the case of end of life, it's, well, who's, who's training staff in old people's homes? in care homes. And then the fourth bullet point, and to be a, accountable to the population served. Not accountable only to the chief executive of NHS England by whatever route, but accountable to the population served. Just leave those up for a moment. Now, here's some points just to reflect. So, how would you learn from others? So, the, the person who picked dementia, are they just going to, are you just going to beaver away on your own? Or would you like to meet other people who are also struggling with this? Um, and we do find that people are so busy that they don't know what's going on even nearby or perhaps even more important, far away. Because it could be somewhere in Cornwall or Northumberland who is doing excellent work. And we are doing, working with people at Essex who are doing excellent work. But the Essex is a long way from Shropshire or Birmingham. But how do, we, how do we do that? And there is an issue if we decide we're going to tackle dementia or um, cardiovascular, uh, should one group really get into it? and then share it with others. The stakeholders are key. So uh, perhaps the most important thing is thinking of patient representatives. And what we do is we say to the patient representatives, look for the next 20 minutes, don't campaign for more money for uh, your particular problem, but think how we get more value out of the resources that are there and always the patient representatives say, well, yeah, uh, tomorrow we'll campaign for more money, but we can see lots more can be done with the money. So step one, define the population subgroup, <coughs> people with X or people with Y. Step two, think of a systems approach, not an approach that mentions mental health trusts or hospital trusts, our primary care teams um, and design the system. Now Neil's put up the um, good point. Great. Uh, Cahoots platform, Neil. Who runs the Cahoots platform? Wonderful name. Um, is I think Cahoots is NHS is now called NHS Futures. Um, yeah. Okay. So on, and there is actually. So we were just going to say there is a PHM um, network on NHS Futures. Yeah, good. good. We'd recommend yeah. everyone to check that out. Okay. So um, someone once said to me, I, I said there was a meeting, and and someone said, oh, "Well, we, we do, there's no point in reinventing the wheel." And uh, uh, this person said, "Well, it's not reinventing the wheel that's the problem." It's reinventing the flat tire, namely, you know, we do have to invent it locally um, to, for local ownership and taking into account local history and geography, but uh, this, we, might, we can learn from others. Okay, good. So let's move on now to uh, the chat. So number one, 
define populations. Number two, design a value framework for the system for that population for people where as you can see there's a degree of granularity so people with respiratory disease and then within that there are different populations people with asthma people with sleep disorders people with copd people with cystic fibrosis then delivery and delivery we're moving now from a world in which we believe that bureaucracies would deliver the world in which it is clear that it has to be networked. Now, bureaucracies are very important. And although since the time of Franz Kafka, the word bureaucrat has been a dirty word, and yes, minister was another program that um, did, did no good for the, uh, for the image of bureaucrats. But um, uh, Charles Perrault, the American sociologist, emphasizes if you criticize bureaucracy, just remember what it's like in a country without bureaucracy. Um, so bureaucracy is very good for linear tasks, like the fair and open employment of staff, or the uncorrupt management of money. So that's what bureaucracies are good at doing. But they're not good at complexity. And most of healthcare is complex. So the approach that's being developed now is to think of networks, communities of value. They're fo focused on value. They're focused on the population with a common need. They're all part of it. each of these is part of some structure, but that's not the issue. The issue is the community of value is focused on the population in need. So what do we mean by networks? Well, what's emerging very quickly are the primary care or locality networks, somewhere between 30 or 50 or 1,000. And in Oxfordshire, where I live, quite a lot of this has been driven by retirement and recruitment, namely the practice, the principal retired, they couldn't recruit another, then another person retired, and the health centre was going to have to close. But they've now joined up with other health centres for a bigger population so they can cover weekends and evenings. Um, and what we're seeing now is sometimes called primary care homes, sometimes called localities, sometimes called neighborhoods. And uh, that seems to be working very well without much central direction. Now, the next level of network is for the bigger population. So here's the problem, here's Barsetshire, and the four pillars are towns, and the hospital's got the skyscraper. Um, so how many networks should there be? Obviously, there'll be in a place like Barsha, there might be there might be 16 localities. But what we're seeing emerging is a value framework in which there might be a, a North Barsetshire um, network that included Mattingly and Bleakville, a South Barsetshire framework that includes serves a lot of Dickenshire and Austin Shire. Um, but apart from and Hogglestock actually the people of Hogglestock go over the border into Austinshire uh, to the Emerton General Hospital. And these relationships are often there for years or decades and they reflect public transport links and traditional links to, to shopping and, and, uh, and schools. So the network should be given responsibility. So if Barsetshire has 57 million pounds for musculoskeletal services, then it's probable that of that 57, about 40 million is the North Bar Barset Shire. Um, uh, 15 million is the South Barset Shire, and a small amount goes to Edmonton General Hospital for that little part of Barset Shire. So there's three networks covering Bar Barset Shire. So what, su what would success be like? We'd have agreed how many networks there were got the right membership, you must have finance people as well as clinicians. 
make them accountable, give them a budget, and create an environment for the networks to, that's what cahoots will be for, the NGS futures, is so people can talk to one another, not compete with one another for customers, but talk to one another and learn from one another. So, going back to um, now what you've been thinking, in the, um, let me ask you a simple question. In the population of your ICS, is it agreed how many place-based networks there would be? So it might be one or two, and part of your population may go to a network primarily based in another jurisdiction. So part of um, um, Staffordshire, I think, goes to Derbyshire, for example, a very small part. So how many networks are there covering the population for the ICS? And it would match the boundary precisely. Okay, then when, um, if, you're, if you're confident you can answer that question, just uh, say yes. Okay, three in Leicestershire, good old Rutland is there. Uh, is there 25 PCNs? That's about, about five to eight to one is, is uh, the, the sort of ratio that's emerging, yeah. So that'll be a, a, a Leicester. Um, I see Rutland's always got to be mentioned. So, uh, uh, and of course, these were, the, of course, the, the craziness of having CCGs that were city-based in uh, Derby, Nottingham, and Leicester for political reasons is now being overcome. Okay, let's uh, move on. Ten minutes to go. So, step four. Ensure each individual makes decisions to optimize personal value. Now, this is a variant of the dollar median curve. And as you can see, the economic value is something to be a higher value, lower value, low value. The point of optimality is above the arrow. But the clinical language is that personal value, the, the, from a personal point of view, a treatment is either necessary, appropriate, inappropriate, or futile. And the importance of this is that it's tied into evidence-based and personalized decision-making. So the evidence refers to groups of patients, but the clinician has to relate that evidence both to the individual's risks and other conditions, and the health service must allow the individual time to reflect on how that relates to outcomes that matters to them. And here are some examples. that If everyone in Ontario underwent surgery, this would be the joint replacement rate. Um, if all patients receive shared decision making, um, this is what the joint replacement rate would be. You can see the huge range, um, the unwanted variation in population-based hip replacement. Success would be measuring to see what proportion of people who'd had an elective operation um, had had the opportunity to use a decision aid and to make sure there was routine collection of outcomes that matter. Now, number five probably should be number one, create the culture of stewardship. And here's the point we were making earlier, that culture is the most important issue in determining the success of an organisation. But it's the one up to now we spent least time on. And a new language is being introduced, and this is a very important document, but I, I never, literally, if I'm in a room with a hundred doctors, I come in a room and not one of them has ever seen this. So we're working to produce a second edition of this in partnership with the Healthcare Finance Manager Association, HFMA. And they talked about waste. If resources are waste, wasted, it's not the taxpayer who suffers, it's other patients. So this is of we need to move from continuous quality improvement to continuous value improvement. So what would success look like? Well, 
Um, here are things you could see. The word value in every document. An annual value report. And perhaps most important of all, the shift of resources from low value activity to high value activity. There will be different behaviours. There will be meetings to discuss value. Use of a new language. And probably an interesting thing would be people speaking with respect of one another. So GPs wouldn't be bad-mouthing hospital specialists or vice versa. They would be thinking that they are in it together. Uh, and they uh, have to understand when something happens they don't agree with and assume it's a problem of communication. So, to summarise, we've tried four things which have to continue. Prevention, evidence-based decision making, quality improvement and cost reduction. Um, however, at the end of decades of success, we can see that there are three big problems, unwanted variation, overuse and underuse. Reorganisation of the structure won't solve the issue. We need a new paradigm called population health management to increase value, triple value. And here are the five key tasks of the future.